Hello, my name is Wesley Schultz, and I'm the Associate Conductor of the North Carolina Symphony, and your host for Behind the Music. Thank you for joining me in this pre-concert talk as we delve into Beethoven's septet and E-flat major with an inside look at the history behind the piece and what makes it so unique. The symphony is looking forward to sharing our performance of the septet with you, featuring guest violinist James Ennis on Saturday, October 24th at 8 p.m. This year, orchestras and musicians around the world are celebrating the 250th anniversary of Ludwig van Beethoven's birth. As one of the world's most admired composers, Beethoven represents the bridge between classical composers like Haydn and Mozart and the Romantics, such as Schubert, Mendelssohn, and Brahms. Though Beethoven inherited existing traditions, he transformed them by infusing his own voice, resulting in works both sublime and profound. Here at the North Carolina Symphony, we are joining the chorus in celebrating Beethoven's contributions to music. And today we feature an early chamber work, his septet in E-flat major. To begin today's exploration of Beethoven's septet, we have to orient ourselves to Beethoven's early life as a composer. The Beethoven of the septet was not yet the Beethoven of the Eroica Symphony, or Ode to Joy, and was not yet struggling with profound hearing loss. When he was putting Quill to Parchment for the septet, he was still a young composer influenced by tradition while searching for his own unique voice. So let's start at the beginning. Ludwig van Beethoven was baptized in Bonn, Germany on December 17, 1770, most likely indicating he was born one or two days prior, on December 15th or 16th. His grandfather, Ludwig Louis von Beethoven, was a bass singer and Kapellmeister of the Electoral Court in Bonn. Beethoven greatly admired his grandfather and for his entire life kept a portrait of him on those wall. Johann von Beethoven, Beethoven's father, however, was not like Beethoven the grandfather nor Beethoven the composer. Though a court musician as well, he was mediocre in talent, cruel to his family, and was often drunk at a nearby pub. Be that as it may, Johann was Beethoven's first teacher of piano and violin, but he was not a good teacher. It is reported that poor Beethoven would be roused from his bed in the middle of the night by his drunk father and made to stand at the piano and practice. Johann was well aware of Mozart and how his father, a far better man, helped develop Mozart's talent as a youth. Johann wanted the same for Beethoven and pushed him into the public eye at a young age. Now, a Bonn court organist, Christian Neffa, was Beethoven's first important teacher. Through his sound teaching and strong mentorship, he taught Beethoven mechanical skills at the keyboard, as well as composition skills. And he also introduced Beethoven to all sorts of musical genres, from chamber music and to opera, and introduced him to famous musicians when they stopped by the Bonn court on their European concert tours. Now, I'd like to share a little story about young Beethoven. Beginning in his preteens, Beethoven, though a student himself, was hired to teach piano to children of the nobility. One family in the city of Bonn, the Brunings, he was especially close to. And on one particular day, one of the children was talking to Beethoven while he was daydreaming and didn't hear her. When he came to, he said, I was just occupied with such a lovely, deep thought. I couldn't bear to be disturbed. The Bruning family started calling these moments a raptus, a withdrawal into his mind. Perhaps the septet that we're exploring today is one of his raptus, a lovely, deep thought. When Beethoven was 22, he traveled to Vienna for the second time, but this time also for good. His mother had passed, his father was on his deathbed, and soon Beethoven's two younger brothers would join him at the center of the Habsburg monarchy. In Vienna, he studied briefly with Haydn, arguably the most famous musician of the time, and then received additional lessons from Johann Albrechtsberger and Antonio Salieri. But aside from his studies, Beethoven made the effort and succeeded in making himself known as a virtuoso pianist. Indeed, he became the most famous pianist in Vienna. So here we are. Beethoven is 29 years old. Though he has had ups and downs up until this point, life overall is pretty good. It was time to focus on composition. 
Beethoven's Septet was composed at the end of 1799, premiered privately at court, and was then given its public performance at a benefit concert on April 2nd, 1800. Now a benefit concert, by the way, is not what we think of now in the 21st century. In Beethoven's time, a benefit was for the composer's benefit. Without recordings or 21st century marketing techniques, composers had to stage concerts of their own works in an attempt to earn money and recognition. So this was Beethoven's first big effort in making his name as a composer and not just as a pianist. Now the septet is in six movements, runs about 40 minutes in duration, and the instrumentation is for four strings, violin, viola, cello, and double bass, and three winds, clarinet, bassoon, and French horn. The septet aims to please. It is cheerful and buoyant throughout. There are no daring experiments or clashing harmonies. The music glows, and it was meant to please the audience in this first benefit concert. Haydn told Beethoven personally that the work is beautiful. No, splendid. Beethoven himself was initially quite proud of the music, and he pushed his publisher to prepare it for publication as soon as possible. But as its popularity increased, eclipsing some of his more serious works, Beethoven began to resent the piece, though not after gaining financially from the work's popularity. It was rumored that when an admirer of the work made his sentiments known to Beethoven, Beethoven allegedly responded with, that septet was written by Mozart. Well, let's talk now about the form of the septet and explore why it has six movements. Now, at the end of the 18th century, the performance of music was still largely confined to the church and to the court. Concerts for the general public were still a rarity. At courts and at the homes of the very rich, the genres of the serenade and divertimento were extremely popular. These multi-movement works contained a variety of moods and emotions and were perfectly suited for listeners who were often milling about eating, drinking, and chatting while musicians performed. Movements of divertimenti, for example, contained preludes, minuets, sarabands, jigs, and so forth. So in 1799, it is no surprise that we find Beethoven composing in this genre, one that he certainly heard growing up in the courts of Bonn, Germany. The first movement opens with a slow introduction in the home key of E flat major, and then proceeds according to the traditional rules of sonata form. The primary melody is spirited and jaunty, and this optimism is carried throughout the movement. Listen to this audio example of the main theme. The second movement is like a sarabande, slower in tempo and serene in character. The clarinet is featured throughout and intones the melody first before sharing it with the violin. We get a minuet for the third movement. Unlike other symphonic minuets that tend to be muted or constrained in character, this minuet by Beethoven is unabashedly joyful. The rhythm quivers with happiness that is proudly worn on the sleeves of the musicians. Now for the fourth movement, we get one of Beethoven's fantastic theme and variations. Now this was a form in which Beethoven lived inside of from his very first published work, a set of variations for piano called the Dressler Variations, composed around the age of 12. Beethoven learned as a preteen how to play J.S. Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier, a series of preludes and fugues in all keys, and thus had in his fingers and soon in his quill, that essence of musical composition, invention, the ability to take a theme and continually reinvent it in the most fascinating and beautiful ways. So here in the septet, we get a marvelous theme with five variations in a coda. The fifth movement is another early sign of a favorite genre of Beethoven's, the scherzo a brisk and virtuosic variation on the minuet that is now forever associated with Beethoven. Here in the septet, the scherzo is kicked off by the French horn and fun and excitement ensue. 
The final movement begins with a somber, funereal sound, but it is quickly forgotten when the presto begins in the home key of E-flat major. Like the opening movement, the music is vivacious and intrepid, and the violinist even gets a cadenza-like moment toward the end of the movement. So there we have it, an early work of Beethoven that became a world treasure. And even though Beethoven never forgave the septet for its popularity, can you hold it against the music? It is young, fresh, and full of charm. Certainly one of the finest examples of the genre, and we are lucky to have it for all time. Thank you so much for joining me in this exploration of Beethoven's Septet, and I hope that you are looking forward to the North Carolina Symphony's performance of this work with guest violinist James Ennis. The concert streams on Saturday, October 24th at 8 p.m. and will be available for 10 days following. Thank you for your support of the North Carolina Symphony, and we can't wait to perform for you.